There's a great apostasy in the world today, and we've been discussing about the great false movement in the world. It is called the charismatic movement. I do not believe that the charismatic movement is a Christian organization. They speak of a Jesus, but is another Jesus. And when I say another Jesus, I'm talking exactly about 2 Corinthians 11 and 4, when the scripture says, Paul says that some were going to come to Corinth, and there were some specific men that he was talking about, that he was talking about. He said they were coming to Corinth preaching another Jesus, another gospel, another spirit. Now, when you preach another Jesus, you don't necessarily use another title. You still say the word Jesus. You use another doctrine. Romans 6 and 16 says, Know you not to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey. His servants you are to whom you obey. The God you serve is determined by the law you serve. It is determined by the doctrine that you serve. And people will say, but doctrine doesn't matter. That doesn't count. Doctrine is everything. The word doctrine, the two common words for doctrine, what is the word D-I-D-A-C-H-E? Now, during the days of the apostolic fathers, the word didache meant instruction. When people say, well, it doesn't matter what instruction you use. It matters completely. Or the word D-I-D-A-S-K-A-L-I-A. Both of them mean doctrine or instruction they mean the act of instructing or the instruction itself. Both of them mean that. Now, when people say it doesn't matter, over in 1 Timothy, the sixth chapter, starting in that third verse, the Bible's talking about from the first verse, men who blaspheme the doctrine of God, he said these men, he said they're proud. Blaspheme doesn't mean some wild thing. It just means to speak against. It's the word blasphemos. B-L-A-S-P-H-E-M-O-S. B-L-A-S-P-H-E-M-O-S. Those who blaspheme the doctrine of God, the Bible says, or they speak against. When you speak against a doctrine, you just say, well, it doesn't really matter, and it's really not necessarily true, and we don't mind uh, what your doctrine is. Just say the name Jesus with your lips. Well, we're talking about the word name on Wednesday nights, and the word name is the word onoma in the Greek, and the, it is the word shem, onoma and shem, O-N-O-M-A, that's the word name, and shem, and it means a man's authority or his character. Well, that just is the character, and whenever we, and the character is the law that a man lives in, it is his reputation. So whenever we do these things in the name of Christ, we are following his laws and his commandment and his character and obedience to his word. And it does matter what we believe. When people say it doesn't matter about doctrine, the Bible says you preach any other doctrine than the doctrine of Christ. He says the man is proud, he knows nothing, he's destitute of the truth, and he supposes that gain is godliness. The word suppose is the word nomizo, N-O-M-I-Z-O, M-I-Z over there in 1 Timothy, the 6th chapter. It's the word nomizo, and it comes from the word nomos, and nomos is the word law, and the word, that's the Greek word law, and nomizo means to legalize or to, or to cause something to be. They have legalized gain as godliness. Isn't that what the Devil's Broadcasting Network, that's we call them, what we call them, a DBN, they call themselves TBN, we say DBN, those are very evil, wicked people. Now, the word devil is the word daemon. You better find out about the doctrine because if, if there's a doctrine of the devil, you better find it out. 1 Timothy 4 and 1 says that in the latter times, the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times, the word expressly means very clearly, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. Faith is death to self. Uh, faith is the substance. Substance is the word hypostasis. Hypostasis comes from hypo and stasis, which means to stay under or through the cross. It means to constantly, continually die daily. And some shall depart from dying 
and they will give up the doctrine of Christ. That is the doctrine of Christ. Faith is the doctrine of Christ. And they'll give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And that word devil is D-A-I-M-O-N. And that word means to distribute fortunes or gain uh, being godliness. Distribute fortunes. That's exactly what the, what the so-called TBN, we call it DBN, Devil's Broadcasting Network. That's what they preach. That's what the devil preached when he took Jesus on a high mountain. He said, if you will fall down and worship me, I will give you the fortunes of the world. That's what he said. Now, the scripture says at the end of time, men will start giving heed to doctrines of distributing fortunes and the flesh. Distributing fortunes is the devil's doctrine. Faith or death to self, that's the doctrine of Christ. If you preach any other doctrine, you're proud, you know nothing, you're arrogant, and you're destitute of the truth. I believe what we're supposed to be preaching is death to self, and if you don't have that, you don't have the truth. Now, that other Jesus over in 2 Corinthians 11th chapter, the Bible goes on to say that this other Jesus, it is Satan's angels transforming themselves into angels of light and ministers of Christ, and it's Satan transforming himself into an angel of light, and the word transform is M-E-T-A, M-E-T-A-S-C-H-E-M-A-T-I-Z-O. That word metaschematizo means disguised. If you're looking for Satan to come, breathing fire and having horns on his head, you're looking for the wrong thing because what we are, need to be looking for is a deception. You know what deceives? Smooth, easy talk. You watch out for people who talk smooth. Doesn't Paul say in Romans 16, 17, and 18, see a smooth talker, they move all the attention away from themselves and they make... They laugh about things a lot, and they try to defer the attention from the truth. And Paul said, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine, to the instruction that you've learned, and avoid them because these serve not our Lord but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. You can believe this. I was in real estate for years. For 17 years, I sold millions of dollars of real estate every year. I was a, million, a member of that arrogant, proud, lifted up, shining above others, million-dollar sales club every year. That is an arrogant thing. That's where men love to shine and get their awards. And it's an evil. And the smooth talkers, if a guy will come in the door cussing and he'll just be loud I can believe that man to be exactly what he is, but if he comes in talking smooth, you better look out. He's going to have his hand in your pocket for long, and he's going to make you feel good. That's called a con man, and, it, and a con man just means confidence man. He has your confidence, and they are likable. You got to watch out for them. That's the crookedest people in business, isn't that right, Barry? <laughs> They're the worst. They'll get you. Here's what they are. And they are the most evil people I've ever been around in my life. They're slick. Now, we are not supposed to be seeking the doctrines of the, of the devil. We are supposed to be dying to self. And by the same token, let me read this up here. By the same token, when I give these people a hard time, we are not to give each other a hard time. We're to rebuke one another, but we're not to be unnecessarily angry at one another, but we are to be angry at men who preach false doctrines. And I'm going to go into that after a bit. Those people who preach, who preach a false doctrine of fulfilling the flesh, the Bible commands us to be angry and sin not. And I'm going to go into that later. It went, but I will say this. The word be angry is O-R-G-I-Z-O-M-A-I. Over there in, now that word, be angry, is orgizomai. It's an imperative mood, imperative mood. Now, an imperative mood in the Greek, an imperative mood is a command. When people say, why are you angry? No, 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 that's not the question. Why are you not angry? God is commanding you to be. Now, let me give you something else about that word. If you are not angry, God's not dealing with you in your life. Because that is what you call 
That is what you call passive voice. And when God commands it, passive means it is being done unto you. He says, be angry and I'm going to do it. So if you're not angry in the context of Ephesians 4 and 26, of Orgizomai, the context of that is the winds of doctrine that bring the church to a place where they are past feeling. That word past feeling is a word that means to be insensitive to the truth. Now, we are to be angry at that, but we're not... To, but when I'm preaching hard against these false teachers, when you come back to the sheep, don't be preaching against a bench against Paul Crouch and John Avanzini and those guys who are lying and turn to your best friend and say, and you too. <laughs> who's here? Who's, a, who's trying to die to self? We have to learn to be compassionate to the believers. Everybody is in a growing place in the ministry. Let me just give you an illustration of something that's happened recently. I watched that Benny Hinn Nashville crusade last night on TV. Benny Hinn is an ignoramus. The man is an idiot. Now, you say you shouldn't call him an idiot. Well, now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. Jesus, gentle, meek, and humble are always conditional. Always. Jesus was never gentle, meek, or humble to the devil's children. He called them names. <laughs> Didn't he? He called them names. People say, you shouldn't call names. Well, tell Jesus that. When he called them liars, murderers, snakes. I saw a special on vipers in the Mediterranean the other day. Oh, did you see the guy that was bitten by the viper the, up in one of the zoos in New York? He was bitten. They said he should have been dead in minutes. And for some reason, the ambulance got there, and he said he remembered he had to hold his arm down below his heart, and they got the ambulance there, and he was a handler of the snakes. He had reached in to feed him. And the Gaboon viper will kill you in minutes. It, has, it, has a, it comes from the Mediterranean, and it has a, it has a, uh, a venom that's equivalent to a, to a black mamba or a cobra. They are extremely dangerous, and he called them killers. That's what he called them. He called them whited sepulchers, blind guides, hypocrites, fools and blind, blind leading the blind, and so on. I just call them idiots. Of course, the Bible says that there's no prophecy of there's no prophecy of scripture of any private. I D I O T E S idiotes. That's our word idiot means unlearned. They are idiots. Benny Hinn is an idiot. Now let me read on here. And I call him stupid, and the word stupid is the word ba'ar. It's the word brutish. It means to have the understanding of an animal. And, and David said, All those that won't be reproved are brutish. They are brute beasts. The word brute, brute just comes from brute beast, and it means dull of hearing, and faith cometh by hearing. They are stupid. When you're stupid, you don't have any faith. There's no dying. You can't die on your own. Now, then he goes on to say, then I went on to write up here. How do you know the devil's children? They teach. We well, told him. He said, your father's the devil. They teach his doctrine, distribute fortunes, fulfill the flesh. They never teach the doctrine of Christ, deny self, take your cross, die, follow, be in the akalathuo, means to be in the same way with, or the same hodos, and it's narrow, and if they don't preach a narrow way, they preach the doctrine of the devil. They don't preach suffer and persecution, and these are verses, I'm not going to quote them all. Those are verses I quote all the time about mortifying the deeds of the flesh and unto you is given the behalf of Christ not only to believe upon him but also to suffer for his sake. Over in Acts 14, 22 when Paul was stoned and left for dead outside of Lystra he said we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God and so forth. My favorite verse 2 Timothy 3, 12 I didn't put up there yet yeah, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. They don't preach that. Now but look, what we want to talk about is how are we supposed to be? I want you to turn over to 1 Thessalonians. And I'm going to read this about Benny Hinn while I'm doing it. I saw, his, I saw Benny Hinn's, I saw his uh, crusade the other night, and Benny Hinn has gone mind, he's gone to, his, to a mind reading act. Uh, he was walking on thin ice now. He's walking on thin ice now. His pride is getting out of hand. He told one woman when she's standing in front of him, your husband is, uh, he's got a round face. 
He's got, he's got, he's becoming a psychic. Friends connection is what he's becoming. Uh, he told one woman, your husband has a round face. He has a scar on his ear. No, no, wait a minute. It's not a scar. It's a mole. And she said, that's right, it's a mole. Now I'm going to tell you how they do that. I read Houdini's biography. Houdini exposed these people in the early 1900s. He was more of an escape artist, and he exposed these people just like this amazing Randy. Now, amazing Randy has got up a million-dollar offer. Do y'all, have y'all seen the amazing Randy? He's got a million-dollar offer. It's standing for anyone can, who can prove to him psychic phenomena. The only problem is he is an expert in authority on magic, and he knows more about that this, than this than probably about anybody in the world. He's probably the best at it than anybody. He exposes these guys, this Yuri Gila that claimed to bend spoons at a distance. He knows how to do it. In fact, Yuri Gila went on Johnny Carson one night back years ago, and I remember it. It's funny. He said, now, I'm going to take this spoon and bend it. And Johnny said, no, no, I want you to bend this spoon out of the commissary. He didn't want to bend that one. He had his own special spoon, see, that had a real soft center, see. And, you, and I can do that. You know, anybody can do that. When it's made out of mush right in the middle, you can do it. It's all tr- tricks and gimmickry. And this, he told a woman that your husband has a round face and he's got a scar on her ear. Now, wait a minute, it's a mole. She said, that's right, it's a mole. Then he looked at this other woman and said, who's Frank? Let me tell you something. When you start calling names, he said, you've been witnessing to Frank. You know what they do? They take, they take feelers and they take people and put them out there in the front. And they, they put them out there in the front, have them talking to people and get information on them. Houdini would get up on stage and he would say, someone over here has a, a dime in your pocket, 1904. And they'd come up, and he'd say, it's a, it's a uh, mercury dime. And they'd go, is that? You know how he knew? Put it in no. The change maker out in front had a little microphone in his ear. And they gave change at the ticket place. And they told him who it was, what it was, what the color was. Told him exactly what it was, where they were sitting. That's not trick. It's just the way they do and the way they work things. I'm not griping about magic because there's no such thing as magic. Okay, if, if you want to be entertained, that's fine. And he oppressed a deaf girl and he had her up there making a mockery of her. Did y'all see that? Just, she was going, they healed her supposed to be hearing, they couldn't hear her speech. And it made me so angry the way he oppresses. Before I read this, I'm going to read something to you. We're supposed to be gentle to one another, not to. We're not supposed to be. Before I read this, let me, I don't know where to go first. We are supposed to be gentle. Let's go back over here to 1 Thessalonians, then I'll go to this. Go to 1 Thessalonians, the first chapter, second verse. Now, there's a couple of words for the word gentle. And we're going to look at both of them. We're going to look at both of them here. Now, this, now here in, in uh, verse 5, I want us to start reading here in verse 5 again. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. Now, I'm in 1 Thessalonians. What did I say? What chapter? One, one and five, or two and five. Two and five. I'll wait for y'all to get there in a minute. Okay. All right. Now, neither at any time we use we flattering words. One more time, the word flattering is the word kolox. K-O, K-O-L-A-X, kolox. That word kolox means... It means to lick the hand. It has the same meaning as worship. Proscuneo, P-R-O, P-R-O-S-C-H-U-N-E-O. It has the same meaning as that because the word proscuneo means to lick the hand and the word kolox means to lick the hand. We have the same meanings uh, for words when the wind blew or the wind uh, raged. Uh, it's the same thing. Uh, we have same meanings. So these words mean the same thing. Kolox and the word proscuneo. Proskuneo comes from pros and K-O-E-N, K-O-E-N, 
And coon means, that means hound or dog. We get the word coon dog from that. And the word proskunel, it comes from pros meaning forward and coon meaning to lick. And that is what the head, uh, the head dog of the pack, everyone, all the other dogs lays down and licks the hand or licks the mouth and say, whatever you want me to have, that's what worship means. Paul said, I didn't come worshiping you or flattering you. But he said, I did come to you gentle. And he says, I didn't come to you with flattering words, and I didn't come coveting anything and trying to treat you real easy and real nice. Nice is not gentle. Nice is the word niskir, N-I-S-C-E-R-E. N-I-S-C-E-R-E. Niskir, it comes from nay, N-I, and S-C-E-R-E. No science, no knowledge. That's what it means. It means to play dumb when you act nice. That is not gentle. Now, let's read on here. He says, Nor of men, so we glory, neither, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. Now, we were gentle. Now, the word nurse comes from the word nourisheth. It means to nourish something. Now, what a nurse does, I'm going to give you some things about nurse here in a moment. Nurse is a very interesting word. Even as a nurse, this word nurse, I said something about the word name a while ago. The word nurse comes from a word that has to do with name. The meaning has to do with it. Now, as a, as, but we were gentle... And the word is epios, E-P-I-O-S. Gentle is the word epios. This is, now, this is what we are to one another. And if somebody starts repenting, there is a difference between someone being rebellious against God's word and saying, I don't have to repent, and somebody over here saying, I have to repent, and I'm struggling, and I'm having a hard time with this particular sin. Would you pray for me? I don't know how to overcome this. I have people coming to me, and they say, uh, I'm struggling with my vocation and there's such a proud vocation and I don't know what to do. Well, I know exactly what you're saying. I was in real estate for years. I was in the music business for years and those are proud, lifted up, arrogant vocations. That's what they are. But guess what? So is the ministry. So is standing in a pulpit. Now, this word epios, the word is a very, it means affable. It means mild. Which is what we're to be to each other. We're not the same thing to each other. It's affable. A-F-F-A-B-L-E. One more time, I'm going to give you the definition to that, affable, because we don't know what these things mean. Affable means pleasant. When I'm around the people here at Grace and Truth Ministries, I'm just as pleasant as I can be. And if y'all go with me out in public, I'm pleasant. I'm very quiet and gentle. And the only time I get upset at somebody is when I hear false doctrine. That's all. I don't go around charging it like a bull in the china closet down at Kroger's and bang, hey, look out for me. Now, y'all hear me talking about, about coming down real hard on some Baptist deacon. That's not every day. I did talk to one Baptist deacon that I used to go to church with, and he'd just look at me and say, are you the only one that has the truth? And then I did talk to another Baptist deacon, and I said, Gene, you've been proud and arrogant and lifted up. And he just struck his head, and he said, I have, haven't I? I said, yes, you have. Don't you think it's time? to start dying to self and say, yeah, yeah. And he's a big Southern Baptist deacon here in town and he, he's a big business person. But he at least dropped his head. It's not every Baptist deacon. I didn't jump all over and beat him up. That's not what I'm talking about when we do this. Now this word, it means, this word, this word gentle means affable or easy to approach. Now y'all tell me, and I had to learn this. This is not something you get to real easy. It means easy to approach, easy to talk to, friendly, gentle, kindly, or amiable. Y'all don't have any problem talking to me, do you? But let me tell you what. When I was 26, I was so... You know what? I didn't know I was cocky, and I was. I didn't know I was arrogant, and I was. But after you get older, you find out that arrogance doesn't necessarily go around strutting with the thumbs. Hey, I'm greater than everybody else. Arrogance just says, well, look, I know what I'm talking about, and you can't tell me. I'm growing up, and I've got it. No, no, the older you get, the more you say, gosh, I don't know. God help me. Now, now what, what is gentle? 
Gentle is like a nurse, isn't it? Let's look at nurse. The word nurse. What does a nurse do? A nurse raises children, doesn't it? That's what this means. A nurse raises children. Let me erase this off the board if I can. If y'all don't wait, I got me a new eraser right here. I'll go into my deal and get me a new eraser. Ain't that good? I'm probably the first guy that's ever stood at the pulpit. I may walk in there and pull some of my notes out of my out of my file cabinet. Now, nurse. I want you to look at this word nurse because it's a nurse raises kids is what she does. Hold on here. So I can get so we need to fill this board up again, don't we? Somebody said one day you filled the board up full of three or four times. Yep. Because we're trying to learn what these things mean. All right. Now, nurse. Now, gentle is being like a nurse, isn't it? Isn't that what it says? Like a nurse. The word nurse is the word trophos. This is the word nurse. The word nurse is trophos. It means, uh, it comes from the word trepho. T-R-E-P-H-O. And of course the word nurse means nourisher. Now when you nourish, you feed. You feed baby's milk. And what's the legal food for sheep? Huh? You feed them nomos. And that means a legally prescribed food. The Lord told Adam, you can eat over here inside the boundary line. You can eat my food. You can't eat of the devil. And what you eat of, what you eat of, what you eat, you eat of, if it's a bad temper, if it's being sharp to one another, that causes your brother to stumble. What, are, what you eat of causes your brother, brother to offend. And we're going to talk about that, too, offend. Now, you can eat. It. We're not talking about whether you eat steak or not. That's not it. The word eat means to partake of. And what you partake of will cause your brother to, to offend or you will be gentle and teach them the truth. Now, you can partake of cursing. If you cuss, drink, smoke, and chew, or if you do something that you're not supposed to be doing, don't expect the people around you not to take liberties to do what they want to do, and don't expect them not to say, well, you do that, I'm going to do this. Now, I'm not going to tell everybody to quit doing all their sin today. That's not what I'm saying. I know Richard uh, Corrigan won't mind me saying this. I talked to him and Teresa last night, and he said, well, sometimes we get to point at each other's sins. Well, you need to stop that. Well, you need to stop that. We need to be more compassionate with one another. And preach hard truth, but be compassionate and be gentle with one another and try to nourish one another and rebuke gently. And then don't drive it in the ground. I'll drive it in the ground as far as TBN or the Devil's Broadcasting Network or false teachers because Jesus drove it in the ground until they killed him for it. But I'm not going to do that with your sin. And I know you got sin you're having a hard time overcoming. What I need to do, what we need to preach to one another is death to self, daily cross, death to self, daily cross. Do you think that's more convicting than for me to tell you, Al, hey, it's time for you to stop doing this. If I just say death to self, daily cross, death to self, die to self, die to self, deny self, utterly contradict self, you're going, oh, me, oh, man, oh, how do I do that? And then you start questioning everything you're doing, don't you? Well, that's exactly what we're supposed to do. The word nurse is the word, it comes from trepho. It's a primary verb. And it comes from a word that means to stiffen or to fatten or to cherish with food or to pamper or to bring up or to raise up in feed. Now, what goes in raising a child? Spankings? Rebuke? All that's part of being a nurse, isn't it? And spankings, rebuke. And let me give you a word here that's so good. It means the word it, it, it comes from the word trepho, or tro, uh, trope, excuse me, trope, T-R-O. This is the basic, that's the foundational word, trope. And trope means mode or style of living. Uh-oh, where are we? Huh? We're back to the word conversation, aren't we? And conversation, 
does not mean just something you say with your lips. Conversation means your method of life or character. Wait a minute. Well, the word name, the word name means character. The word nurse comes from a word that has the basic same meaning as character. Your character or your reputation. The word nurse comes from a word that means your name. Well, what is your name? Your name, the word name means authority. The word name means your reputation, your character. And the word character comes from C-H-A-R-A-X, and that means a stake on a boundary line. Well, when you get your last name at conception, the boundaries have been set. I had to live in the boundary, in the border, in the house of Harless Brown, and I had to abide by his rules. That's my name, and that was going to be my character, and I was going to be raised in that household, and if I was raised correctly, I would be nursed in a conversation in that household. I would have a method of life, and the one who nursed me was supposed to be my mother and raised me up. The mother was the teacher, and Babylon was the mother of harlots, and Jerusalem is the mother of us all, and all these things tie together, don't they? So nurse comes from something. The nurse is going to teach you your character of life, is going to nourish you, is going to feed you. And God says, I scourge every son I receive. He said, I spank my kids. I correct them hardly. I take them through long, hard trials, and that's my belt, or that's my razor strap. So when you're nursed, you're brought up in the legal food of God. And guess what this is called? This is called being gentle. And you know what this makes you? It makes you affable and easy to approach is what it does. When you're raised and when you're nursed and you're nourished. See, you nourish someone. A nurse was someone who nourished others. Well, let me just, let's look at it, one of these words for trope. This is really good. Uh, I got a word here. Look over Hebrews 13, 5. Look at Hebrews 13, 5. Then don't, t don't lose your place here. We're going to come back here. Hebrews 13 and 5. Hebrews. So the word nurse and the word name go back to the basic same meaning, don't they? Why? Because a nurse is going to teach you, going to feed you, going to spank you, is going to correct you and give you instruction about how you're supposed to live and act. Well, Jerusalem is our nurse. That's our mother. And that's the mother of us all, and the mother was the instructor. So she's going to teach you what your name or your conversation is supposed to be. She's going to say to you, have has anybody ever had this said? You don't ever want to be a reproach to, the to your father's name. Or, or you were brought up to be so-and-so, and we don't want you giving the Brown family a bad name. So that's a nurse or a nourisher, isn't it? Well, sure it is. So a nurse is one that teaches you your name, doesn't it? And goodness, where would we go with that if we went back to Wednesday night? We, where did I say let's go? Okay, Matthew 13. Matthew, uh, Hebrews 13. Look at Hebrews 13, and here's that word to play right here. And everybody has been here on Wednesday night. We'll get this real quick. Hebrews 13 and verse 5. Hebrews 13 and verse 5. Verse 5, let your conversation, your trope, your name, your method of character and what you are, your family name. Did you know that the word gentle means to come from, in the Webster's, means to come from a very affable family. That's one of the definitions. A gentle man or gentleman is, uh, is one who is a gentle person in the respect that he's, he has what they call breeding. And we're not talking about blue bloods. We're talking about you've been bred and raised and nourished to live right and do right and say the right things and be what you're supposed to be. Now, now John, uh, what's his name, Hagee, said one time, he said, Jesus is a gentleman. Well, he meant it. I don't know what he meant by that. He didn't mean what, the Bible, what Webster's means or what the Bible means because if you're gentle, you'll nourish people, you'll correct them and rebuke them. He meant he wore spats and, and uh, a tails and a top hat. I think that's what he meant. I don't think that's what Jesus is. He says, let your conversation be without covetousness. Let your lifestyle 
your behavior be without pleonectes, P-L-E-O-N-E-K-T-E-S, pleonectes, that means wanting more. Want more. That means want more. And what is the want more? And when somebody beats you out of what you feel is rightfully yours, what do you call that? And you get this big, big angry feeling. Or gay. Or gay. Or gay. God has not appointed us to the or gay, but to obtain salvation. And the word or gay is the wrath of covetousness. When he hadn't appointed us to wrath, it's not talking about over there. Uh, it's not talking about over there in Revelation 16 and 1 when the wrath of God falls on the earth. That word wrath over there is the word thumia, T-H-U-M-I-A or T-H-U-M-O-S. That word means to breathe hard after when the wrath of God falls. That's not talking about First Thessalonians 5 and 9, meaning that he's going to come in the middle of the tribulation. That means he hasn't appointed us to the wrath of covetousness. That is the word wrath. You've got several words for the word wrath in the Bible. You better find out what they are. He hasn't appointed us to this, and this word orge means to try to take revenge for yourself. And to get mad at people. We're not appointed to that. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. We're to be gentle with the sheep, correct the false teachers real hard, and then back away and leave them alone. And when men won't repent, I don't go out of my way to get a hold of them and shake them by the teeth. I don't do that. I leave people alone in public. Now, he has not... It's this... It's the, it means the method of living. It's the word manner in Jude 7. It is the word... Now as, in 2 Timothy 3, 8, now as means your method of living. It means, it's the word in 2 Thessalonians 2 and 3. Look at 2, go back to 2 Thessalonians 2 and 3. 2 Thessalonians 2 and 3. 2 and 3. Let, let no man deceive you by any means. Don't let man's lifestyle, what they're saying, what they're thinking, what they're talking... Don't be deceived by any man's means because it's just not true. If it's not true, what they say, their slick lifestyle, their easy talk means nothing. Don't let men con you is what he's saying. And why would Paul say that? Because everybody can be conned and everybody is easily conned, and conned including me. I've had a lot of people come into this group that have conned me. They've claimed to be my friend, been real nice to me. Nice is not gentle. Nice is being a nurse. I mean, nice is being, is being no knowledge. Gentle is being a nurse. I'll get it right in a minute. Gentle is being a nurse. It's, this is the word uh, in Matthew 23, 27. As a hen gathereth her chickens, Jesus said, so would I have gathered you under my wings, but you would not. As is the word trope. It means in this manner or in this lifestyle. It's as, you think those little words are not, are not important? <laughs> as, trope means this has the same meaning as nurse, or it comes from the word nurse. One nurses you, nurses you into your asness, as you should be. It's the same word Luke 13 and 37, or 13, 34, uh, when he says, as a hen gathers her brood. In Acts 15 and 11, it's the word as. Where we shall be saved even as. So it means by the might. Let's look at that in Acts 15 11. Acts 15 11. Our salvation is by our lifestyle. We're not saved by works, but we're saved by working faith. And our behavior and our conversation will change when we become new creations. We become new creatures. We will change. And God will see to it, and he'll cause us to change. Acts 15, 11. Acts 15, in verse 11, when people say, well, little words, these, they, they put out a new Strong's Concordance, and they did away with a lot of the little words, and they stuck them in the back, and they put them in just a section with a general definition, and they said they weren't important enough to put in. In fact, sometimes they took the word put. When you get a Strong's Concordance, say, I want the full concordance. I don't want the condensed version. Because they, I'm sure they took these words as out. How can you take this word as out of the Bible when it, has, when it comes to the base meaning of being a nurse or being gentle? And it's connected with the definition of having a name or a character or a reputation or a conversation or a lifestyle. Now look here in Acts 15, 11. Acts 15, verse 11. 
But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they, as the others, just that will be saved as the Jews are saved. The Gentiles will be saved as the Jews by the same lifestyle, by the same method, by the same behavior. God will change our life. It goes from the previous verse. And when he said, Why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, uh, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? And he's talking about not causing, he's talking about the lifestyle of not trying to live by ritual and causing the Gentiles to be circumcised because some guys had followed Paul back to Jerusalem in this 15th chapter of Acts. He was coming in from the 13th and 14th chapters from his first missionary journey, and he had some Jews follow him, said, hey, you've been preaching these synagogues up here in Asia. You need to circumcise all these people. He said, no, we'll be saved the same way the Gentiles are saved, by our lifestyle, and that's what salvation is. God will change us into new creations, and we will be obedient to his behavior, to his trope, and he will nurse us and whip us and spank us. Now, that's what gentle, that's when you're being gentle, that's what you're being to people. And certainly our conversation is very easy. But sometimes I have to turn to somebody and say, that's not right. Don't do that. Don't say that. You don't know that. I do that often around here. Haven't y'all heard me say that? And that's what we have to be. And that's being gentle. It means to be easily approachable, but it doesn't mean to be a pansy. Isn't that something? Now, it's the word as... In 27 and 25 of Acts, it is the word way. Then Romans 3 and 2, much every way. In Philippians 1.18, look at this one more, Philippians 1.18. Philippians 1.18. Philippians 1. First and second. Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, first, second, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Philippians. Look at Philippians. One. Let's look here. At, let's look here. He says uh, in verse 16, the one preaches Christ. Well, he says, let's start at 15. He says in verse 15, some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. And some also of goodwill. The one preaches Christ of contention. Some fights while they're preaching. You're not supposed to be doing that not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bonds. I had one preacher told some people that left here, they were real disgruntled and mad, and he said, Jim knows a few Greek words and that's all. I don't have any idea how many Greek words I know because I know a ton of them. Now, if he knows I know a few, he knows more than I know. He must have counted them, I guess. But, <laughs> and I don't care. I'm not going to give him a hard time. If he wants to talk about me every day, I won't let him. But the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel, one then, notwithstanding there every, notwithstanding every way, notwithstanding every way, that's that word, tope, comes from the same word as nurse. When you nurse somebody up, you nurse them up in the way, and the way would be equivalent to the whole dose, wouldn't it? When Jesus said, I am the whole dose, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It would be a synonym. Our method of living is the way, the whole dose. And he said, no man comes to the Father but by me. And he said that way is narrow. And the word narrow is the word T-H-L-I-B-O. And it means to crowd through a narrow opening. And Paul used a form of that when he said we must through much tribulation, T-H-L-I-P, L-I-P-S-I-S, enter into the kingdom of God. That's the way. So that's our method and mode of living, telling the truth. And someone has nursed us to that point, and we, 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 then we learn to be gentle with the believers. These, if you'll notice something about the Greek language, when they said a word, it had depth. We have length and width. We have got a harlot language called English, and it just sells out meanings. The word gentle doesn't mean be nice, act nice, be goofy. Just pretend you don't know what's going on, act dumb. Be nice. That's not gentle. That's stupid. Bugs the tar out of me when people say that kind of stuff. No, where was I here? And he says, 
notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And you know what he said? And I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice as long as Christ is preached. And I don't care if Bill wants to give me a hard time. Bill, go ahead and preach. That's fine. Give me all the thunder you want. But it'd be better if you didn't contend because you're not bothering me. Because we don't care. We're just going to keep on going. Now go back over to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, second chapter. He's talking about nourishing. And he's talking about cherishing, isn't he? Let me give you this word cherish. The word cherish. He says, but, be, but we are gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. And the word cherisheth is the word thalpo, T-H-A-L-P-O. They need to invent some new pins. T-H-A-L-P-O. Thalpo. This word thalpo, let me give you this. It means to, to be warm towards, to brood, or to foster, to cherish. And in, in the Webster's, brood gives us, it comes from the Middle English and the Old English, which are basically the same. It means basically breath. Breath. Brood. Now this word means to brood or foster. Now the word brood means basically breath. Now when a, mo when a, when a mother chicken is over her brood. She's giving them breath. She's going to give them life. And it means to sit upon the eggs is what it means. And to hatch the eggs and to raise them up is what it means. The same idea of the word in the Genesis account where it talks about uh, brooding over the water. Is that it would probably be the basically the same thing because life was going to come when he said let there be light and then we could get into oxidation and in photosynthesis, of course, that'd be exactly it. And of course, that was the truth. That was life. The word brood means to, it means to the offspring of a family or animals to sit on eggs and to hatch or to hover over. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler and thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night nor for the arrow that flieth by day nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy sight, and ten thousand even at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh unto thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. The wicked are not part of this. We're not to be gentle with them. They're the one that's shooting the fiery arrows at us. And he'll give his angels charge over thee, and they'll bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone at any time. He'll cover us with his feathers like a mother bird covers her brood. He will nourish us, but he will not nourish the devil's children and he will not be gentle to them. He never was, was he? I guess my favorite verse in the 23rd chapter of Matthew concerning the hard words of Jesus when he said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you traverse sea and land to one make one proselyte, and after he's made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Does that sound gentle? They killed him for being that gentle. Now, that doesn't sound gentle, does it? We'll be gentle with one another. It means to hover over to protect. That's all I'm trying to do. I'm so angry at these liars. I'm trying to protect the flock and say, you get away from them. Don't you abuse them and tell these poor little widow ladies and tell these people that they give you your last penny so you can live high. I, a young fellow called me last night. He said, I watch all this Christian TV. And how he said, I watch TV and I watch you and I watch. And he didn't know the difference. And I started explaining it to him. He said, that's right. That's what they preach. And he didn't know. And I'm trying to protect him. I said, you stay away from them. They lie to you. And what I'm trying to do is hover over the flock. But Jesus was not gentle. He was gentle to his family, to his brood. And we are his brood, aren't we? That's what we are. That's over in Psalms 91 if you read that. If you want to read about, he'll cover thee with his feathers. And that means to foster. Now, the word foster comes from the Middle English, fostern, F-O-S-T-E-R-N, F-O-S. 
Paul Stern. Now, what we're doing, when we're mad at each other, we're trying to get our own revenge, aren't we? I'll get my, I have my rights, and I will, you won't do this to me. We're not to be doing this to one another. I'm going to tell you something that makes us compassionate towards one another. It's doing things for one another. I used to think that all my big mountains were so big that everybody needed to stop and take time to help me with these mountains. And, and I blamed everybody in my life but myself. I thought, I'm a pretty good guy, and I deserve, I deserve. I don't go out here and cuss, drink, smoke, and chew. That was before I went out there and lived wildlife in nightclubs all over America. And people should help me. People don't help you because you're a nice person. They don't help you because you're new, goofy nice, you know. Well, I'm just deserving. I'm going to tell you why people help you. They help you because you're merciful to them, because you reach out to them. I feel so completely unworthy of, I guess, uh, talk about mercy. I'm going I'm to say this in front of him. He don't like me to say nothing, but Glenn is probably just one of the dearest friends I have ever had in my life. He does so many things for me personally, and I'm going to say, why you do this? I'm not deserving of this. You're doing this for free. And it makes me want to give to him. You want attention? He's got my attention all the time. I love that man as much as any man I've ever known in my life. If I need something, he says, this log is broken. He knows I'm not a fix-it person. I'll fix it. I'll get it real quick. He don't do a few things. He does things I can't do. He does so much for this ministry, it's impossible for me. And I sit back and when he does something, I'm, I'm just little Jimmy Brown. Why is he doing this for me? That's uh, mercy. Grace is unmerited favor, and he does things all the time. And you want to know what makes you love somebody? That! What do you think is going to make people love you? Because you're deserving, you're sitting back there, and you're innocent, you don't do anything bad, you don't do anything wrong, you just don't do anything. You think that'll make you deserving? No, sir, it won't. And it won't even make people want to do anything for you. Being considered and general and loving that's what makes people want to do things for you. He does things for me constantly around the house, repairing stuff. He, one day, my block had busted in my 87 tempo. And he said, I'll pull that head off after church. <laughs> pull off after church? You can't do that after church. He does that for people around here when somebody needs breaks or somebody needs... I've never seen a person do as much work in my life. And you know what he does? He makes people love him. That's what he does. And he's the most unlazy person I have ever met in my life. If y'all will notice, when we get through, he'll be back there working. He'll come in and make a comment. He's go back and check a tape and do something. Now, that's what makes people love you, and that's what makes people be gentle to you, too. And, and I'm talking about our word, gentle. Yeah, we've said enough about Glenn. <laughs> foster. It comes from foster, and it means to nourish up with care to rear. If you care about your kids, do you let them have ice cream and cake? Do you distribute the fortunes that they define as fortunes? Do you distribute they? Now look, Dad, you love me. You need to distribute fortunes to me. I want ice cream and cake, breakfast, dinner, and supper. And I want to go to the movie every night, and I want to stay up till three. Distribute fortunes to me. No, no, son, I'm going to spank you. That's why I love you. I'm going to whip you. I'm going to make you go to bed, and you're going to go to the dentist, and you're going to get that needle that long in, you, in your jaw because I love you. That's what love is. That's what nourishing is. That's what's being a nurse, and that's what makes our conversation what it is, and that's gentle. That makes us gentle, doesn't it, as we grow older? And it means, you know what it means? The word foster means to develop about danger as well as feed and correct. While you're around danger, who's the dangerous? The false teachers. We're not to be gentle to them. You have to know gentle is conditional. It means to clean in one's mind unto. Wait a minute. 
Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The mind that we have in our nursing, in our nourishment, in our conversation, when we're being gentle and when we're taught to be gentle, we are gentle to one another. We have the mind of Christ, don't we? And we're being fostered by Christ because we are his adopted children. We're not his literal children. He made us out of filthy clay. Then he birthed us and made us alive. And he's fostered us. That's what that means. It's not talking about whatever you want it to mean. I like that, don't y'all? Let me read something to you. When we're gentle to one another, we don't use cutting words to one another. We're not supposed to be doing that. Let me just say something about certain things that's easy to do when you're a Christian. Off-the-wall humor and sarcasm has to be used so very sparingly on Christians because a lot of people are babies. And when I was 20 and 21 years old, I didn't understand that. Sheep can be offended at words that you don't mean. Did you know that? And especially if they're young in the faith because they don't understand your intentions. When you're joking, your intentions can be good, but the results can be devastating and cause a division in the family of God. And a lot of times, that's all the problem is. It's a communication thing because people are not trying to make clear what they're saying. I have a very, I personally have a very contemporary sense of humor. It's very abstract. I mean, sometimes it's, and things, abstract things that contrast one another are funny to me. Cutting contrast when the preachers, it's like a cutting contrast. That's what I do. I cut these guys down on TV. When they come on TV, if you're in a room with me, I told Brooks one night, I said, I can't help it. I've got to hammer these guys when they're on TV. It's like, it's like the world is listening. It's just me. If I'm in the room by myself, I'm talking to them. And I'm using these goofy words. I comment to them constantly on the television, don't I? Has anybody been around? All the time. I scream at them, I yell at them, I talk to them, I say stupid things, I dumb things, but I'm not going to talk to the sheep like that. Watch yourself. The sheep, especially the lambs, do not understand this kind of humor. Watch what you say to each other. And don't necessarily go out in public. It's what they say sounds so ridiculous. Their statements are so idiotic. I say the obvious when talking to it, but don't do that to each other. And I rebuke them sharply, and I use great plainness of speech. If Jack Van Impey says that demons are extraterrestrials, which is what he says, that's from another planet or from another universe, or their God sent them down here, my mind goes into gear and goes click. And my mind goes into gear because of my word definitions I understand immediately. And knowing what demon or demon is, and he, he says demons are extraterrestrials, and that means to distribute fortunes immediately. I say, not if they're not bringing a bunch of Cadillacs out of the sky, you dumbbell. But I'm not going to talk to God's sheep like that. Now, I like that kind of humor. Just be, I'm going, what? The extraterrestrials are demons, and they're bringing eyes and in investments. Here, here's your investment book. Let, if we put you a bunch of money, nations right there. See you later. <laughs> Isn't that dumb? Well, I like that kind of humor, but don't talk to the sheep that way. When y'all hear me, and I'll say that to the TV, and I don't, when I'm around y'all, I'm very gentle, I'm very careful what I say. Be careful what you say to each other. And I'm going to use a cutting remark to him, like Elijah did to the prophets of Baal. Look at that over there in Second First Kings, over to First Kings. Now, Elijah, people say, you shouldn't say that to them. No, no, we shouldn't say that to the sheep. They think they're sheep. They're goats. If a man's acting like a goat, he better watch out for the words that I say. But if he's a sheep, we're not supposed to be doing that. We're supposed to be gentle with one another. We're to be gentle with the sheep. Okay, First, first Kings 18. First Kings 8. Let's look at this. I want you to see this. I keep mentioning this, and we've, we hadn't read this, and I hadn't read it in a couple of years. First Kings 18. Elijah has been hiding in a cave for three and a half years. Jezebel's chasing, or he's fixing it. He's, uh, he's been hiding. He's come out to meet the prophets of Baal, 450 prophets of Baal. 
Baal was the fire god. They wore the tall white pointed hats, white, white sheets, worshipped a flaming cross on Lady Day in the ancient world. Yes, the KKK comes out of that. And he was re represented by the crescent moon or the, the female deity. The grove was represented by the crescent moon. She was androgynous. That means both sex. When she was a female, she was called Venus. When she was male, she was called Allah. And everywhere you find Allah, you find he was represented by the crescent moon. That's what he's represented by. And everywhere you find the crescent moon worshipers, whether it's on the hats of the fezes of the, of the, of the uh, Shriners, or whether it, the priests of Baal wore tall white pointed hats, white sheep wore a flaming cross on our Lady Day, Remember that. And was represented by the crescent moon. The female deity was represented by the crescent moon. That was his consort. And when it was changed, when the female was changed into a male, it was Allah. And Allah comes from Alon, meaning oak tree. A-L-L-O-N. It means oak. Now, Allah is not another name. It's not another name for Jehovah. So therefore, when the female deity was changed to a male, then you get... The same system that David Duke comes out of is the same system that Louis Farrakhan comes out of. They're brothers, and they don't know it. Congratulations, guys. Get together and shake hands. And they're also brothers with the Shriners, the Masons, and Christmas, and Valentine's. And the swastika comes out of the same system. So Hitler was it? their brothers. Hitler, Hitler, David Duke, and... Louis Farrakhan need to get together because <laughs> it comes out of the same thing. The swastika was called the sun wheel and Baal was the sun or the fire god and the broken parts of the... Let me just get back up here and show this to you. The broken parts of the, of the swastika... Let me erase this. The broken arms on the swastika were called the flame. They were the flames of the sun. When Hitler became a Svasti, he went back into Tibetan sun worship. He went back into Tibetan sun worship to get the swastika. And the swastika originally was called a, a sun wheel. Oops, I'm going too far. It was a sun wheel like so. And he had the brakes here. And the swastika was a sun wheel or the fire wheel. And they worshipped a wheel that they called Yule. In the Scandinavian countries, it was called child or wheel. He was the child of the sun. And they worshipped a fiery wheel. That's where we get the wreath. So the wreath is the swastika. That's the sun wheel. So next year, place a swastika on your front door at Christ Mass season. Put one of these up on your front door right there. Okay? It's the same thing. Comes out of the same system. So Hitler was a swastika. They were Tibetan sun worshipers, and that's, that all comes out of this system right here. When Elijah's going to make fun of these guys, how ridiculous is just what I told you? Is that ridiculous? It's outrageous. When you see the clan, when you see them with the swastikas on their armbands, that's what belongs there. I was so funny. I was watching one of them talk shows one night, and one of those clansmen came out, and they brought a tree out, a Christmas tree. And it had swastikas all over it. And I said, hey, that's great. I like that. That's good. It belongs there. And some indignant Christian come up there and said, I won't have this, these swastikas on my Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> you idiot. Oh, I mean, I about just fell out the floor. I said, they belong there. Leave them there. They're sun wheels. The consort is the tree. Isn't that great? Isn't that funny? It's just hilarious. Huh? They were telling the truth. Yeah, the truth. They knew more truth. Than the, the addicted Christian. <laughs> Lordy mercy. I, it was hilarious. I said, oh gosh, I got it. I wish I could get that to wherever it is. <laughs> just keep it to show everybody because I just fell out in the floor laughing. Because, see, I knew what the swastika was. I knew what those tall white pointed hats, the pointed hats, when the pointed hats are closed, that's the fish's mouth. When it's open, it's the Pope's matter. That's the fish. That was Dagon, the fish god. Equivalent the same thing with Jeric term for the sun god Baal. It's all it was. And dag means fish. And when you had, in Christmas was, I don't know how I got into this. Christmas was the festival of the Lord of Misru from the 17th of December, the 25th of December. 
that was the festival of the Lord of Misrule. They took a fool and put him in charge of the society for that seven days, and they put the fool's hat on him. It was a pointed hat. The dunce hat. It's the dunce hat. It's the same thing. It's a, those bunch of dunces. When you look at the clan, they're dunces. That's what they are. What they are, are they Dagon worshipers? They're sun worshipers. And they call themselves Christians. See, calling yourself a Christian, they're just like a bunch of Baptists. Baptists call themselves Christian. They don't do what God says. Now, here they are right here. It all goes back to here. Look here. Now, do you think it's worth making fun of those people? Is that idiocy, what I just showed you? And that's true. And what's so, so sad is Debbie researches for me all the time, and I research, and I got a library, and I dig all the time, and we got all this information in our libraries. Did y'all know that? That's what's so sad. Everybody's lazy in America. Only 6% of people in the world read, and that includes, I read that out of an article years ago, and it's probably less now, and that means everything, everything from the comics to magazines to the Bible to pornography. Only 6% reads anything. America's dead in the head is what they are. Look here. Here it is. Now, you think that's worth making fun of? Yes, but don't make fun of one another. Be gentle to each other. Now, let's, let me read on here. He says here in, in 1, Corinthians, 1 Kings 18, verse 24, he said, and call you on the name of your gods. He said, let's get out together here. Elijah came and met with him. Let me read verse 21. Elijah came in and all the people and said, how long halt you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. If the Baal God be God, follow him. That was Hercules is what his name was. That's what he was called when he was imported into Israel in the 16th chapter of 1 Kings. He was, you don't find Hercules in the scriptures, but when you study Baal, that's just a generic term for Hercules and Tyre and Sidon. Now, this is funny, isn't it? Yes, it's funny to laugh at the idiocy of a ridiculous people. But let's don't laugh at each other when we're struggling with sin and having a hard time. Let's be gentle. If Baal be God, follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I even, I only remain a prophet of, of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. And, and sometimes when you think you're alone, you're not because Elijah didn't know that there were 7,000 that had not bowed the knee to Baal in Israel. 7,000 prophets of God. They were being hid in caves. You're not alone. Let them therefore give us two bullocks and let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on wood and put no fire under it and I will dress the other bullock and lay it on wood and put no fire under it and call you on the name of your gods and I will call on the name of the Lord and the God that answereth by fire. Let the God who can bring fire out of heaven, let's call him the true fire God. You remember Deuteronomy 4 and 24, I believe it is. The Lord our God is a consuming fire. You say your God's the fire God? Our God is the fire God. He says, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, okay, you've spoken well. We'll let the one who can bring fire out of heaven be God. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, choose you one bullock for yourselves and dress it first. For ye are many and call on the name of your gods. Because they were many. And they all were generic terms for the same thing. It was just the deification of Nimrod, the original Hercules. But put no fire under it. We're going to see if your God can bring fire out of heaven. Okay? And they took the bullock which was given them and they dressed it and called on the name of Baal from the morning even unto noon saying, Baal, oh Baal, hear us. You remember over there in the book of, of Judges where Gideon pulled out all the, all the uh, gods of Baal and, and, uh, and the people said, you've taken Baal away, we're going to kill you for that. He said, wait a minute. Why don't you let Baal plead his own cause? If he's a god, let him rube, R-U-W-B, R-U-W-B, let him plead his own, let him fight for himself. You say you've got a god, why do you have to fight for him? I'm not going to fight for my God. And why are we fighting each other for God? And why are we trying to conquer all these people out here? We're not supposed to be doing that, getting revenge. Let God do it, just like he did with this man right here. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped up on the altar which was made, screaming and yelling and jumping up and down and cutting themselves and looking like idiots, just like a bunch of Klansmen at a rally. Just like Louis Farrakhan, when he gets 
together a bunch of preachers and pretends to sell people on the idea that, that, that Allah and Jehovah are the same. They are not. Allah is a tree. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them, saying, Well, now, Elijah, and, and, and don't you know that one of the prophets came and said, Elijah, do you think you're supposed to be making fun of these people? Elijah mocked him and said, Won't you cry aloud? He is a God after all. Maybe he's talking. <laughs> he's busy. He's having a conversation with somebody. I know you guys are having a hard time getting hold of him. If you'll yell louder, he'll get hearing. I know you guys probably, you probably, God probably needs a hearing aid. That's probably it. He can't hear. Or, or maybe he is pursuing. Maybe he's gone somewhere or he is on some kind of journey. He's gone off. Maybe your God went to Florida. And maybe he's on a vacation and he can't hear you. Why don't you keep on? And when he gets back, he'll hear. Or peradventure, he's just sleeping. He needs an alarm clock. You guys don't have to scream real louder because he's like Brooks. He's hard to wake up. <laughs> and, you, and he has to be waked up. So yell real loud. Was he laughing at them? What they were doing was idiotic. Well, so is the Christ mass, and so is the swastika, and so is the pointed hats and the fish's mouth and the Pope. The Pope wears the mitre of the KKK. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Mm -hmm. I wrote a Christmas song. I don't guess I need to sing it. <laughs> no, I won't sing it. <laughs> no, wait a minute. Children roasting on an open fire. Tovet nipping at their toes. Firewheel songs being sung by a choir of KKK in Balaam clothes. Every Muslim knows that Mecca is the place to go to worship Hercules' wife, Grove. Jehu said, Jezebel, you're dead. <laughs> May the dogs eat your nose. They say that Jehu's on his way. Jehu's the one that had Jezebel thrown down from the, the tower. You know, because she brought sun worship in Israel. I just thought I'd write a song about that. They say that Jehu's on his way. Uh, I get it written down here. <laughs> <laughs> they say that Jehu's on his way. He'll have you thrown from the balcony by slaves. And every eunuch's child is going to fly. If there's a way out of this and you don't die, Jezebel. Eunuchs don't have children. Y'all do know that. Allah's crescent moon is on the wane, then sunrise services for Baal. Ashtaroth is an upright tree. Happy birthday, dear Baal. That's what that's about. I think it's stupid, so I wrote a... Uh, they don't. Every eunuch's child is going to fly if there's a way out of this and you don't die, Jezebel. <laughs> yeah, no, she died for bringing it into Israel. Now, I made, that, I made fun of that and laughed at that because it's stupid. Christmas is stupid. It's not God. It's not Jesus' birthday. It's the birthday of Hercules in the ancient world, Baal. This person that Elijah is facing, it's his birthday. That's what December the 25th is. In the ancient world, back then, if you said, when was Baal's birthday, they'd say December the 25th. When they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lances till the blood gushed out upon them. Why do you think God don't want to make us to make cuttings on our bodies? And that's not talking about tattoos. That's talking about flagellating ourselves like the Roman Catholics do to make ourselves suffer. That when the Bible says unto you to give it to the behalf of Christ, not only to believe upon him, but also to suffer for its sake, we suffer for his sake, not just suffer for the sake of cutting blood and cutting our bodies and saying we need to get rid of the bad blood in us. They used to bleed people when they did that. We ain't talking about stigmata. No, we're not talking about stigmata. Let's read this. He says... They cried aloud, and they <clears throat> cut themselves. The blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was passed, and they prophesied until the time of the evening of the, of the offering of the evening sacrifice that there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. They worked all day long trying to bring fire from heaven with the fire god, with Hercules. And he wasn't gentle to them, was he? No. And with the stones he built 
an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood and said, Fill four barrels. He laid the altar. He laid the sacrifice. Fill four barrels with water, poured on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, Do it the second time. Four more barrels of water. And they did it the second time. And he said, Do it the third time. Four more barrels of water. Twelve barrels of water. And they did it the third time, and the water ran about the altar and filled the trench also with the water. And it came to pass at the time of the evening, at the offering of evening sacrifice, he's going to offer the lamb at the evening sacrifice and say, I don't even need a match to offer the evening sacrifice of Israel. Watch this. He said, God will bring his own fire for his own sacrifice. Let me tell you. You don't need to take revenge on people. God has not appointed us unto the wrath of covetousness and take revenge on people. You don't need to do that. God will take care of Elijah's enemies. And it came to pass at the time of the evening, at the offering of the evening sacrifice, that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, watch how short his prayer is. Isaac, I counted these words. It's 63 words. It took him 63 words. Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord. Hear me that this people may know that thou art the fire God. Thou art the Lord God that thou hast turned their heart back again, and the fire of the Lord fell. There's the fire of God, Jehovah God. And consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And all the people saw it. They fell on their faces. And they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And do you think he had some enemies? And do you think he was being nice to them? Do you, he wasn't even being nice, much less gentle. And Elijah said unto them, and he's, he's really going to show you haste. He's, now, I'm going to be real gentle to you. I'd like to kill you at this time. <laughs> Would, you all come forward? Would you come forward while I ram, ram you up inside the ribs with a dagger? Now, is he being gentle? Being about as gentle as Jesus was when he said, your father's the devil. And they said, we'll kill you for those words. That wasn't gentle, was it? He wasn't nice here or gentle. And Elijah said unto them, take the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and killed all of them. That wasn't very nice, was it? Why didn't he give them an invitation and say, Just as I, we like to ask the prophets of Baal to accept Christ as our personal Savior. Accept Christ as your personal Savior. Accept Christ. I get tired of hearing this. All right, let me read the rest of this to you that I wrote on this paper here. We're not to talk like this, like Elijah talked to the prophets of Baal to one another. We're to be gentle. We're not to contend with one another. We're not to talk like this to one another. We're to be gentle. We're to be meek. Believers, we're to be meek with believers who are wrestling with sin. We don't demand the repentance of our wives and friends and our husbands. We preach death to self, daily cross, 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 death to self, daily cross. Understand? I didn't mean to be sharp about that. Then, if we try to hurry our families up, I thought we believed in predestination. I thought we believed God, we predestined, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed, to be conformed. Conformed is a continual movement. It's a continual development. You mean you expect everybody to be where you are today? Well, where were you when they were there? You're, you were their age. Or where were you when you, you, you were their age spiritually? You can't make people. If we're predestined to be conformed, I don't want anybody here that God doesn't have here. I don't want anybody to repent that he don't have repentance because he's got a time and purpose for everything under heaven, doesn't he? Time to be born, a time to die, a time to repent, a time to turn. And we, all we can do is preach death to self, day to cross, death to self, day to cross, deny self, death to self, day to cross, mortify the deeds of the flesh, agonize over sin. That's all we preach. We don't want to say, it's time you quit that sin right there. And I'm going to get mad at you if you don't. That's not our business. It's not my business. I, we got several people here in music. 
I can't tell them when to quit music. I'm going to tell you what, music is a cancer. I told Johnny Cash's daughter that one time when I was in real estate, I was showing a house, and they didn't tell her I was in music. I just showed her a house, and they didn't tell her I'd been in music. And I was going through a house, and she was telling my husband, Marty Stewart, my father-in-law, Johnny Cash, my father, Johnny Cash, my this, that, and then we walked in the living room, and I just looked at her, and I said, music is a disease. She, she went, ah! That's right, it is, isn't it? I said, yes, it's a disease. Isn't it, Sid? What it does, it wants to shine, doesn't it? But I can't tell people what to do and when to do what. I can't tell you when to quit every little cuss word you cuss. Now, I will call you down. Some of you know that. And I will say something about things I know that's hurting you, that, that you need to be doing. And I'm going to be gentle about it. I'm not going to say, I demand that you do this right now. If you don't, I'm going to be mad at you. Because why am I doing that if he's predestined us to conform and he's got this great orderly arrangement of all things? What if, he's got, what if he's got you ready to quit that sin right here? And I'm saying, look, I want you to do it right here. <laughs> what is this? God's putting you through this fire to get your brain to crush you right here over it. It's, what if I said, I think everybody needs to quit sinning this morning. <laughs> We're not going to do that. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and his word is not in us. How much time do I have, Bruce? Oh, man, i got, got to get... Let's go, let me go back to this. I hope you'll understand that. We've got to be gentle to one another, but not to the false teachers. The only time I'm tough on people is false teachers. I'm not tough to the people here. Oh, me. Revenge belongs to God. We don't demand the repentance of our wives, our friends then we want God to hurry. That's what they said in Isaiah 5. Hurry up, God. Show us your, show us your judgment. We want to see it now. The Bible says that's sin when we do that. Hurry up. Look at that. Go over to Isaiah 5th chapter. See, we want God to hurry and let us see what his judgment is. Look, I think it's time for me to set the bounds around here. No, no, God has got the bounds set. It's not up to us to do it. Isaiah 5. <clears throat> Verse 18, Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin as it were with a cart rope. A lot of people who have a lot of sin in their lives dragging it around like it's on a cart, being proud of it, say, that say, let him make speed, hurry up, and hasten his work that we may sit. I'm ready to sit now, God. When are you going to let me see your work? Wait a minute, that's what we say when we demand repentance and we get angry with our family and friends who are agonizing and wrestling with sin. I'm not going to do that to people. And I'm gentle to people, but I'm not gentle to those guys, these liars out here. Elijah wasn't gentle to the prophets of Baal. Hasten his work that we may see it and let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come now. We want to see it now. That's sin. We want to know it now. That's what they're saying, isn't it? And what they're doing is calling good evil and evil good. Do you know we have a tendency to do that? We think it's good for us to make people repent right now when God's got them through a fiery trial and he's going to make this sin drop, sin drop off at this point and this sin drop off at this point over here. And God's got a method and a path. I'm not doing the sin I was doing 28 years ago, but I had this great, big, beautiful tenor voice. And if you told me to stop singing at 28 years old, I'd told you to go fly a kite. That's what I'd done. If you told me to quit singing at 30 years old and... The people that have heard me sing that boy, I could ring the rafters with him with it. Whew, boy, it's just, just like Pavarotti singing them high season days. But if you told me to quit at 30, I'd say, you are a lame brain. Get out of my life. It's not up to me to tell people when to sin. It's up to me to say, die to self, daily cross, deny self, mortify the flesh, deny self, die daily. And we've got to preach this daily. But we don't get mad when God don't deal with people who repent today. I don't want you here if you're not in here. I don't want people believing that are not believing because God's got the order and arrangement set up for the belief of the elect, for the predestined people. If we believe in predestination, why are we fighting each other? We're not supposed to be doing it as believers. Look, let me read this, the rest of this. We become... When we tell God to hurry up, 
we want to hurry the orderly arrangement of God when he has a time for all things, including your spouses, to cease from the sin and your children to cease from there and me to cease from mine. We're not to be sarcastic, using insults to one another and hurting one another. And I, I, I'm real sarcastic towards the devil, devil's broadcasting network, but I do not, I do not believe in insulting the sheep. Not even some that, that are struggling. I've had people struggle and wrestle, and they'll say, but Jim, uh, I don't understand how this, all this thing works. You insult them, don't you insult the sheep? Never, never did. I never insult the sheep, and you've got to be very careful. Just because somebody hasn't come to the place of repentance yet, if they're wrestling over here, and just because somebody leaves, I told Chad Match yesterday, and Chad's a young preacher, and he follows us down there, and he's one of our, uh, he told me, he said, you tell anybody that you talk to that you're my father in the ministry. Chad's 24 years old. He struggles. He gets uh, angry and upset. He told me one day, he said, I told the people, now why aren't y'all, now why aren't y'all responding to my message? Now don't you think, and Chad won't mind me saying this because I love Chad. He said, all y'all don't understand, what's the word nomos? Well now, come on. I said, now Chad, don't be that way. He said, I said, don't demand that the people know right now. And I was worse than Chad when I was 24 because he's really trying. And he said, you know what he said to me when I said, Chad, I love you. But don't make people repent today if God's not ready for them. He said, uh, I, need, I need help in that area. We all need help, don't we? He said, I need help. Would you help me, Jim? He got real humble to me. I need the help in that area. We need to love one another. We got so many different personalities here. We're not supposed to be kicking each other's brains in. Just because I give the Devil's Broadcasting Network a hard time, don't do that to each other. Let's be compassionate to one another. We're to be gentle. We're to be easily approached. That other word, gentle. You remember the other word, gentle? Epiikos, huh? Epiikos. E-P-I. E-P-I. Let me write that other word, gentle, down. I don't have time to go into it. E-P-I. E-P-I. E-I-K-O-S. It comes from epi, means a superimposition of the icon or the character of Christ. Image. Epi, icon is what it comes from. It means that and we're predestined to conform to the icon of Christ, to his image and what he was. He was gentle to the sheep and he was hard on the false teachers. He was loving to the sheep and protecting even when they'd wander off and he'd say, Peter, when... He said, you're going to deny me three times. And the third time that Peter said, I know not the man, Jesus turned and looked at him. And, and Peter broke down and he wept. Jesus, Jesus didn't say, I told you so. It's not what he said, he just looked at him. The Bible said, Peter went out and he wept. And don't try to get revenge on your friends. God will get revenge. Let me show you something here that's so good. I want you to look over here. At, go over here to 2 Kings 2. I'm going to show you about Elijah, or Elisha. I'm just going to show you this. It's not very long. 2 Kings. Look at this. 2 and 23. 2 Kings 2. God will get revenge. Don't try to get your own revenge. Remember, revenge is the wrath of covetousness. He didn't appoint us to that. Let's be gentle to the sheep. Give, give the false teachers a hard time, but don't just live giving them a hard time. The Bible says if they refuse the word of God, withdraw from them, avoid them, go out of your way to stay away from them so you don't have a confrontation. And we're to have a life of gentleness and meekness and quietness. That's what the Bible says. Our lives are quiet. When I'm not in a pulpit giving false teachers a hard time, I'm very quiet. Most of the time, I'm very gentle. I'm easily approached. There was a time I wasn't. There's was a time I wanted my way. Look here in verse 23. Speaking of Elisha, he went up from thence unto Bethel, and as he was going up by the way, there came forth little children. And these were not little boys and girls. This is the word na'ar, N-A-A-R. I like what theological word book says about them. 
The theological word book says that this was a large, bands of, a large band of teenage rowdies is what it was. A bunch of teenagers who thought they had it together. And they started laughing at Elisha. This word na'ar comes to be mischievous or revoke. Now, little bitty five-year-olds can't do that. They can't revoke. It means uh, it comes from a South Arabic derivative of the Tigray language in Ethiopia, meaning to instigate rebellion. That's what it means, na'ar. And these were a bunch of young boys, according to the theological word book. The word na'ar means anyone who is... <clears throat> From birth up to up through their puberty years, up into their teenage years. That's what it means. These were a young, bunch of young rowdies making fun of Elisha, giving him a hard time. Forty-two of them. <clears throat> like they're going to do something bad to him and beat him up. And they said, they came out of the city and mocked him and said unto him, Go up, thou bald head. Go up, thou bald head. You know what they were saying? No, that's not what they were saying at all. See if you don't know. See if we don't know the meanings, we don't know what it means. Baldness was equated back in that day and time as somewhat of a curse. They equated it with leprosy. It was superstitious that it had to do with some kind of leprosy. And they were saying, since you have inherited the mantle of your father, Elijah, and you're such a prophet, go up in a fiery chariot like he did, thou leprous one. <clears throat> Elijah, you think Elijah needed to fight for himself? No, God says, you mess with my messengers, I'll destroy you. This was the man of God. This is a man who had the power of resurrection. And he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. He cast their name out. And there came forth two she-bears out of the wood and tear forty and two children of them. Of these young teenage rowdies is what it was. But Elisha didn't have to get involved in the wrath of the orge and say, I'll get you guys. I'll tell, God to call, I'll tell God to call fire down on you. And you know what? Elijah didn't have to get real greatly concerned when Jezebel had Naboth killed and made false accusations against him, this righteous man. She thought she had gotten by with murder, and 13 years later... Jehu took off up to Jezreel and he came to the palace at Jezreel and said, throw that woman down and eunuchs took her up and threw her down on the ground and the dogs licked her blood there and ate her body. Now, you know, we don't have to be caught up. I don't, I'm not going to try to defend myself against these guys. I'm going to preach the word to them. If they want to kill me, that's fine. We are not... We're not to be involved. Look over here. Let me show you something here. I heard, Pat, I heard uh, James Robeson say something the other day, and it was just so ignorant. Go to James, the first chapter. James, the first chapter. Go to James, the first chapter. James Robeson was trying to figure out the wrath of man. He didn't even know what he's talking about. He was talking in circles and saying, well, now, yes, I know that Jesus was angry sometimes, but, boy, when we're wrathful, this doesn't serve God. No, no, we are to be angry or gizomai. That's passive. It's a command. God's going to put this anger up on us, but we are not to sin in that wrath. What is the sin? The sin, the word orge comes from the word orgizomai. The word orge is feminine. This is the wrath of covetousness. Babylon was the mother of harlots. We are to be angry. We're to be angry, but we're not to be sitting in this anger. It's what I'm supposed to be doing. So when he says be angry and sin not, the sinning part, when it, the sinning part is the orge. Be angry is O-R-G-I-Z-O-M-A-I. Orgizomai, be angry. It's a command, imperative. It's passive voice. It's going to be done unto you, but you're not angry with the sheep. 
And sin not. Don't get involved in the orge or gizomai, but don't get involved in the orge. Because that's getting your own revenge and being revengeful for yourself and getting your own way. That's not what he called us to do. Now look here, just look at this and I'll stop. He says, verse 19, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, slow to orge. Slow to your own revenge over what people have done to you. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. That don't just mean getting mad any time. That word wrath is orge. The wrath of covetousness. When you think somebody's beat you, or you think somebody's cursed you like, like Elisha, and you're going to take your own revenge, I'll get my revenge. God says, no, vengeance belongs to me. You know what I've learned as I've gotten older? Just since I've started this ministry, I used to think people should repent and stay in this ministry because I thought they were supposed to. I think you ought to repent. You've been in predestination. You should be here right now. What are you leaving for? Well, that's stupid. I was stupid. I was even stupid five and six years ago. Because I thought, okay, God, it's time for them to do this right now. And God says, no, no, Jim, I got them down here. I am set for this down here. Why are you insisting that they get it right when you're ready? So he says, the orge of man doesn't work the righteousness of God. We are, he has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. The word obtain is the word peripoesis. It means a wrapping around. There's only one thing it wraps around. That's the blood baptism. That's a death to self. He's appointed us to death to self. That's faith. He hasn't appointed us to the orge. He hasn't appointed us to defend ourselves. We're to be gentle to the sheep, tell the truth to the liars, and God will cause, he will slay the prophets of Baal. God will take the revenge that he wants to take. It's not up to us to do that. We, I've got so much more on this word gentle and meek. I'm going to stay in the word meek. I'm going to stay in the word gentle. I'm going to stay in the word patience and humble. Do you all see how all these things are conditional? That we're to be like Christ, that's gentle. And when we're gentle, we're epios, we're nurses, and we're cherishing the people, and we're brooding over them, and we're protecting the baby sheep and the baby lambs. Say, so you, you false teachers, get away from these baby lambs. Being gentle and humble and meek has nothing to do with evil false teachers. But don't buy, by the same token, don't get the idea, because I'm giving them a hard time. We're supposed to turn around at each other. It's like Dwight said when he said he watched us two years and they didn't come up. He said, I thought, boy, as soon as I walked in the door, he said, hey, you get over here. Sit down. <laughs> now, you, you need to change your ways right now. No, no, that's not what I'm going to do around the sheep. We laugh around here. We have a lot of fun. and we, we love each other. This is the most loving group of people I've ever been around in my life. Well, I'm going to stop here. I'm going to come back next week. I've got some more things to say about humble. Remember, humble, let me just say this. Humble, when, when that's also an imperative, and there's a false humility, and that's when man falsely humbles himself. Because humble is what God does. It means to level mountains, and Babylon is the mountain of pride. She's the mother of all idolatry, and she is the mother of covetousness. And she was built upon, let us make us a name. So that's where the wrath comes from. So we have to be, in, other, in order to quit partaking in the orge, we have to be humbled and leveled. Well, only God humbles. He cuts down mountains and hills. We don't humble. He commands it, and then it's passive voice, and it's being done unto us. All these things are conditional. I'm sure everybody has had a hard time with gentle, humble, patient. What's the difference between long-suffering and tolerance? All the difference in the world. We're talking about these things. I'm going to stay on this subject on Sunday morning because it's in complete opposition to what people think it is. We're to be gentle and sweet to one another, but by the same token, when somebody's a believer and rebellious, we're not to put our approval on them and to be cheerful to them if they refuse to repent. And I'm not talking about, well, my husband won't do this. My wife won't do this. My son won't do this. No, no, that's, we're not talking about that they refuse. If they refuse to acknowledge they need repentance. When a man acknowledges he needs repentance, he says, I'm struggling. We're to pray for him regardless of what sin is in his life. We don't start pointing at sin. We say die. We say mortify. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and truth. Thank you for helping us to understand that we're not to go out and get our own revenge against the evil people. But, Lord, we're certainly to be gentle to the sheep, to the flock. 
Lord, help us to understand that it's so hard to understand these things. Help us to understand gentle and meek and humble. That's all conditional. It's toward the sheep. It's toward the flock. It's not towards the lion that David grabbed and beat him to death with the sword, with the club, Lord. It's not the, we're not gentle to the bear who would destroy and devour the sheep or to the wolf or the false teacher. who are com certainly compared with wolves, Lord. We're not to be gentle to them. We're to be gentle to one another, not contending and fussing and fighting, demanding repentance when we want it. Because we certainly do believe that you preordained and pre preordained us to conform and you've got everything set and you will do it in your time. And we'll give you praise for all these things. Lord, help us. In Jesus' name, amen.